about this issue, and thank you. Uh, thank the gentlelady for her testimony. Thank you, Ms. Stoner, for your presence and for listening to, uh, joining us and listening to Ms. Watson's uh, statement. I want to thank Mr. Jordan for being here. You're welcome to come back if you are able to from your busy schedule. Uh, Ms. Stoner, you're dismissed as a witness. We want to invite the other witnesses to come forward. Thank you. While the witnesses are coming forward, I'd like to make the introduction of our second panel. <coughs> Mr. William Walsh is of counsel, Pepper Hamilton LLP, where he heads that office's environmental practice group, and he's representing the American Dental Association. Before 1986, when he joined Pepper, Mr. Walsh served as section chief of the U.S. EPA. Office of Enforcement as lead EPA counsel on a precedent setting hazardous waste lawsuits brought against Occidental Chemical Corporation concerning Love Canal and related landfills. Uh, Ms. Uh, 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 next will be Mr. R. Stephen Brown, the Executive Director of the Environmental Council of the States, the National Nonpartisan Association of the States Environmental Agency Leaders. Mr. Brown helped form. Uh, uh, the Environmental Council of States in 1993. Previously, he worked with the Council of State Governments as its chief environmental staff and with private engineering firms in the Kentucky Environmental Agency. He has 34 years of experience in state environmental uh, matters. As the chief executive of ECOS, Mr. Brown has been closely involved in its mercury policy matters for the last 10 years, including the work of the Quicksilver Caucus and the mercury policies of the association. Uh, another witness that uh, we were anticipating, Mr. Alfred Dubé, who is National Sales Manager of Somatex, had to cancel his appearance today due to death in the family. Uh, without objection, I ask unanimous consent to include Mr. Dubé's statement in the record of hearing, and uh, this committee sends its condolence to, uh, to him upon uh, the death in the family. Mr. Uh, Alexis Kane is an environmental scientist with the U.S. CPA uh, Region 5 Air and Radiation Division. Mr. Kane holds a Master's in International Affairs from American University, Master's in Environmental Studies from Yale. He's been with the U.S. CPA for 15 years. He works on mercury control efforts, including as uh, the U.S. co-lead from the Great Wakes Binational Toxic Strategy <clears throat> and on the development of mercury reduction strategies under the Great Lakes Regional Collaboration. He's testifying before the subcommittee on his own behalf, and his testimony is not in his official capacity, and he does not represent the positions of the EPA. I wanted to make sure that disclaimer is put out there. Mr. John uh, Rindel, is it? Is that correct pronunciation, sir? Mr. Rindel is a retired professional engineer who worked for Dane County, Wisconsin, as a recycling manager for many years, including on programs to reduce the flow of mercury to the environment from products. He's researched and written on mercury air emissions from crematoria. His reference paper on crematoria, which is updated on an ongoing basis, has over 130 references to both literature and discussions with people uh, uh, everywhere. The Mercury Policy Project was formed in 1998 and works to promote policies to eliminate mercury uses, reduce the export and trafficking of mercury, and significantly reduce mercury exposures at the local, national, and uh, international levels, and, uh, and that is certainly due in, in great part to the uh, initiation work of Mr. John Rendell. Now, it's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear on all witnesses. Before they testify, I would ask that you rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth? The whole truth, nothing but the truth. Thank you. Let uh, the record reflect that each of the witnesses has answered in the affirmative. I would ask uh, that um, each witness give an oral summary of your testimony. Keep the summary, if you would, to five minutes in duration. Your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. Mr. Walsh, you're our first witness on this panel. I ask that you proceed, and thank you for being here. I'm William Walsh, outside counsel for the American Dental Association on Amalgam Wastewater Issues. On behalf of the ADA, it's more than 157,000 member dentists. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for the opportunity 
to discuss the Memorandum of Understanding with EPA. Prior to that MOU, the ADA met periodically with EPA, urging a national voluntary program to reduce dental amalgam in wastewater and implement educational programs and take other actions. Even without amalgam separators, approximately 99% of the amalgam is captured either in the office by other uh, parts of the uh, plumbing uh, system or in the sewage treatment plant, which captures prior to discharge into the rivers um, uh, a substantial amount, 95% of uh, the uh, uh, mercury that enters uh, that's related to amalgam. Now let me make it clear, because uh, my earlier testimony at the last hearing model to estimate releases instead of measuring these releases directly. I think that there are several reasons that a model can be useful. First, a model can provide estimates, however rough, of sources that are difficult to measure directly, such as releases from the land application of sewage sludge. Second, a model can generate estimates of releases caused by particular products. Direct measurement, for instance, can give us an estimate of how much mercury is emitted by incinerators, but it requires a model to estimate how much of those emissions result from the disposal of a particular type of product. Uh, third, a model allows us to predict the impact of various management options, for instance, to estimate the potential decline in mercury releases resulting from installation of amalgam separators. Finally, a model provides a check on emissions measurements and indicates where additional measurement may be warranted. I'd like to focus now on mercury emissions from crematories. In the case of, of these releases, EPA's estimate is that total nationwide emissions were 0 0.3 tons in 2005 based on extrapolating from emissions measurements. The model, however, estimates that these emissions are more than two tons per year based on data on the average mercury content of fillings, the number of fillings that an average person has at the end of life, and the number of corpses that are cremated. As a general rule, there are good reasons to prioritize measured results over an output from a model. Well, I believe that in this case, the model's results are more reliable. US EPA's estimates are extrapolated from a small number of emissions tests at a single facility, which could generate a misleading result, given that we would expect releases per cremation to vary greatly, depending on the number of dental amalgam fillings in the particular corpse being cremated at the time that the measurements were being made. The hypothesis that emissions inventories may understate the significance of mercury emissions from crematories is supported by evidence from emissions testing in Europe, where there has been more testing done than has been the case in the United States. For instance, the National Emissions Inventory in the United Kingdom uses an emissions factor of 3 grams per cremation, while Norway and Sweden each use an emissions factor of 5 grams per cremation. US EPA's emissions inventory implies emissions of 0 0.4 grams per cremation, far lower than the likely range suggested by Euro the European evidence. The life cycle flow model implies emissions of 2.7 grams per cremation, which is more consistent with the European evidence. Given all the uncertainties, I certainly do not claim that the mercury flow model has produced a correct, estimates, a correct estimate of mercury emissions from human cremation. However, I believe that the evidence is strong that EPA's estimate understates emissions from this source category. I believe that an appropriate evaluation of all the available evidence would lead to an increase in EPA's estimate of mercury emissions from crematoria. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Randall, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Congresswoman Watson. My name is John Rindel. I'm a volunteer for the Mercury Policy Project because, unfortunately, Mr. Bender um, became ill and has been unable to attend. I do have 13 slides that I will go through very quickly since a lot of these topics have been covered already. If we could have the next slide, please. Uh, this chart, and it's repeated in the written testimony, shows the quantity of mercury used in 2004 and the quantity of mercury that is currently in products. As noted on the chart on the left, about 25% of all the mercury used in 2004 was in fact for dental amalgams. And as stated before by your chair, about 1,000 tons of mercury are currently in the teeth of people in the United States, by far the largest source of mercury in any products in the United States. Next slide, please. 
Uh, we, we believe that mercury from tooth fillings is one of the largest sources of mercury uh, that is discharged uh, from uh, dental, from various sources to wastewater treatment plants. Uh, since a typical amalgam has a lifetime of 10 to 20 years, we have to look not only the mercury that is currently being used, but the mercury that was used because those fillings will come out approximately 15 years later. And as has been noted before, mercury that escapes into the environment, regardless of what form it is, is going to be converted to methylmercury, which is going to build up into fish and enter the human body. Next slide, please. Uh, we have gone over the mem memo of understanding uh, several times before, so I will skip this slide. And in fact, uh, the next slide talked about, talks about the memo of understanding even more, so I will skip that one as well. Thank you. Uh, EPA testified that there were 12 states that have mandatory agreements. Uh, we were aware of 11 of them. Obviously, if 11 states or 12 states have agreements, 38 or 39 do not have agreements. Next slide, please. Uh, what we find is that for a suitable best management practices program, these are the elements that need to be included. Uh, it needs to include the installation and proper management of amalgam separators, requiring the dentist to recycle their mercury, and requiring reporting to verify compliance. This chart uh, will show uh, the partial estimate of uh, sales of mercury amalgam separators. Uh, the states in the white, which are the far right of those bar charts, shows those states without legislation or requirements. Uh, and the tall ones represent those states with legislation. Only 13% of amalgam separators have been sold in the non-regulated states, even though those are 38 to 39 states, three times the number of regulated states, the amount of amalgam separators is less than one-seventh of those otherwise sold. Next slide, please. Here's a comparison of the EPA's estimate of mercury releases uh, from dental sources to the atmosphere compared to those represented by the Mercury Policy Project. As your chair uh, mentioned before, the estimates of the Mercury Policy Project are five to seven times larger than those estimates of EPA. And as you can see from the slide, there are several areas that EPA did not include any estimates whatsoever. Next slide, please. This shows a flow diagram that was originally developed um, by a Swedish chemical agency and was used actually as the basis for our mercury flow models uh, throughout the United States. Next slide. My big focus, though, is going to be on cremation. This is the area that I have specialized in. And as we see from this chart, and again, it's in your written testimony, the number of cremations is expected to dramatically increase in the future. We believe that this is going to increase the amount of mercury that's emitted to the environment. And additionally, what is happening is because of improved dental care in this country, the dental community has really done a super job. More people are having more of their teeth when they pass away. But in those teeth, there are more dental restorations, that is, mercury fillings. And therefore, we're going to have an increase in mercury emissions for two reasons. One is increased number of cremations, and the second is more dental restorations. The next slide, please. This shows a bunch of numbers, which is kind of hard to see on the wall. But if you look in your testimony, you will see that our estimates is that the amount of mercury will over double within the next 10 years as air emissions from cremations because of the combined impact of more cremations and more dental restorations. Last slide, please, is a summary. Uh, there are seven to nine metric tons of mercury released to the environment per year. That's growing rapidly. We don't feel that the premise of the MOU was based on true facts. We believe EPA should establish effluent guidelines for dental offices. We believe that their dental air emissions data should be updated, especially for cremation. We believe that EPA should regulate mercury, cremation, mercury emissions from crematoria. And we believe that EPA should maintain a transparent, open process to include the non-governmental organizations. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Reindel. Uh, Mr. Walsh, uh, we're going to go to questions now. Uh, you testified that the ADA filed public comment in 2007 against bringing dentist offices under uh, mandatory effluent guidelines. The reason to exempt dentists was, as you uh, state, because dentists can and, and will act on their own. But isn't it true that nearly every state or local jurisdiction that has tried to get dentists to voluntarily adopt mercury separators has then chosen a mandate or threatened a mandate a separator requirement because dentists were not, in fact, acting in large numbers on their own? Well, I think it's inherent in any uh, voluntary program that I'm aware of that there is the implicit or explicit uh, consideration that the next step is regulation. In the MOU, we specifically say that EPA and the states reserve that right. In fact, in the communications that the ADA uses to its members, it points out, uh, as it must, to be honest and forthright with its members, that if they do not do a voluntary compliance, the likely next step is an en enforcement. So we're just members, we're just some members waiting for mandatory? There has been, I think, uh, a very uh, long education road to educate the dental professionals about this issue. When I was first retained uh, by the ADA, um, there was very, back in 2001, very little knowledge of what the regulatory regime was. They were dentists. They had not been involved in many environmental issues. They also had some scientific issues about what was being said. A lot of people took the 50% uh, numbers of what was going into the plant, uh, POTW plants, and said that was what was coming out. We built a factual basis that showed that it was uh, uh, a non, uh, 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 you know, a problem that was significant in terms of the influent, that uh, the benefits of recycling, and on a science basis, which professionals like the Dental Association and its members uh, are understanding uh, more, and we look at the data, uh, and there were early failures, and the dental community was part of the reason for the failures. Uh, but if you look at the pattern, not only in, in, in the uh, voluntary programs involving dentists, but other voluntary programs, because for 20 years, the water office has used voluntary programs. In situations like this, where there's a large number of small entities that have to be regulated, and it has uh, mainly to do with their own resources and their own priorities, we thought that if we have a consistent message from the ADA, from the regulators, and those states or localities where there's either local conditions that are required more stringent, they should go ahead and, 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 and do what they think is appropriate. We preserved all the rights to do that, but we think it actually will be quicker uh, to do this on a voluntary basis, and we understand that um, if we are not successful, that uh, a likely outcome is uh, that EPA will issue uh, a regulation. Mr. Brown, would you like to respond to what he, Mr. Walsh said? And, and pull that mic close. Sorry. Okay, yep. thanks. Got it. Um, voluntary programs have a purpose and a place. And, uh, but our position is that their time as the solution has passed. We need to have EPA under the Clean Water Act exert its authority to issue a rule on this matter. And during the process when that rule is developed before it is finalized, that takes years typically, that the voluntary programs can help educate dentists about their obligations and get, that, uh, get some results before the rule actually comes to place. Now, Mr. Walsh, you saw that chart on the wall, right? I did, yes. The, the, I mean, it wasn't, you know, the one where, uh, not that one. The, the chart that deals with the dentists seemingly responding when mandatory regulations are, are uh, requiring adoption of mercury se separators. I mean, I, I, just, I just wanted to ask you, because you've seen it, um, wasn't, isn't that evidence that dentists respond when you have mandatory regulations? 
Well, I think you need to look at, you know, the individual cases. I'm asking cases. what you looked, what you saw, not what I saw. Well, what I saw is a, a number of different factual uh, backgrounds. Uh, one of the charts shows, uh, I believe, Min uh, either Minnesota or uh, Minneapolis and its voluntary program. That was a relatively successful voluntary program, and it was followed by agreement uh, and uh, of the local uh, dental association to go to a. Uh, Are you a talking about Massachusetts? Paper. No, I was talking about. Uh, say, take a look at that chart. I just want to make sure you're talking. That we're talking about the same thing, because if you're talking about Massachusetts, uh, they they had a uh, uh, they had a different reason for um, uh, for their compliance in Massachusetts. This letter from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which I'll put into the record, says. Uh, Quote, a big jump in uh, Salmatex, Inc., separator sales apparent. Uh, in Mr. Dubay's exhibits, starting 24 months prior to the effective date of Massachusetts regulations, which were adopted in 2006, this sales increase starting in 2004 was concurrent with an innovative incentivized early compliance effort implemented by uh, MassDEP in concert with the development of state regulations requiring separator use. So we'll put that in the record on objection. Do um, you have any comment on that? Um, without having read the details, you know, know what I'm going to I'm, I'm going to as a general as a general over. matter, as I said uh, in, in a few seconds ago, many of these programs, voluntary programs, were some of them were do it voluntary within X number of years or we're going to make it mandatory. In a couple of cases, they decided they didn't need to go to the mandatory case. Um, part and parcel of any of these voluntary kinds of programs uh, is the implicit or explicit threat of um, there being a mandatory requirement. Um, but if there's no mandatory some, requirement in the offering, no the voluntary compliance is going to be low, right? That is true. OK, I, I'm, people, gonna, I'm done. Okay. My, that's my question. Fine. That's what I wanted to hear. Now, Ms. Watson's going to have five minutes, and then yes. we'll be back. Thanks. Thank Chair recognizes Ms. Watson. Thank you very much. Um, I, I mentioned uh, a bill that I had called the CHOMP Act, and it stands for Consumers Have Options for Molar Protection first uh, letter of each word spells chomp, and we chomp on food. Um, your organization came out in opposition to my bill, the CHOMP Act, because the ADA believes that mercury amalgam is safe. However, the CHOMP Act addresses important consumer knowledge. Do you believe Dennis should tell every patient that amalgam is uh, mainly mercury? The testimony that I have prepared and what I've been prepared uh, to talk yes, about no, has to do no, no. with the do you, MOU. And can you answer my question very I, specifically? No, I can't answer your question because I, I am not the person at the ADA who has uh, responded to you. We no, can respond in uh, writing. Let me ask it again and listen to it very carefully. If I'm not speaking clearly, just let me know. Do you believe dentists should tell every patient that amalgam is mainly mercury? Yes, no. You mean me personally, you're, you're, you're asking? Do you, you, Mr. Walsh. Just as Mr. Do Walsh. Do you believe that dentists should ask that question or tell the patients that amalgam is mainly mercury. I think I'd have to know more about the issue than I do. All right, all right, all right. If not, state in what circumstances, in what circumstances should dentists withhold from patients that amalgam is mainly mercury? I'm not aware of any circumstance in which dentists withhold that information. Do you, can you think of a time when they should tell their patients what 
amalgam is composed on and what percentages of mercury is in amalgam? This is not something I'm either qualified to or prepared You're not to aware. respond. You're not aware? Yes, no. Uh, it's not a question I am capable or qualified to answer. Or are you capable or qualified to know what's amalgam? What is I, an amalgam? I do know what amalgam is, yes. Okay. Do you know the percentages of uh, what makes up the amalgam? Yes. Okay. Is amalgam 50% mercury? Uh, on average, yes. Okay. Do you think a person should know that amalgam is 50% Mercury. That's beyond my preparation for this meeting. Is mercury safe? The FDA has said mercury and amalgam is mercury safe. safe. Well, you have to look at the use, the exposure to determine it in, in certain uses. It's not safe. In other uses, at least government agencies uh, let, have let found it to Maybe be safe. I don't really speak clearly, so let me speak real clearly. You have a nine-year-old child in the dental chair, and you're going to fill that cavity in that child's mouth. The mother is sitting right outside the door or maybe inside because no one likes to go to the dentist. And um, if the mother would ask the dentist, you know, what are you putting in my child's mouth? Do you think the dentist should tell that mother what's going in the mouth? I, if and we're I talking were, about professionals. If I were asked the question, I would answer the question. But I, you know, you're asking. We're it talking in a about context. a professional dentist, DDS, and the mother wants to know what is going in the child's mouth. What do you think? Who, who do you this represent? I represent the American Dental Association on okay, amalgam wastewater issues. It, okay, I'll accept that. Okay, now something goes in that amalgam, and when they finish, you know, they usually give you some water and you spit it out. It becomes wastewater, it goes out to the sewage plant, and then it goes into the ocean. Now, if you were asked by a parent, is there anything in there that will put my child at risk? You think a dentist should say yes, no? Apparently, you're having trouble with these I, questions. I, I, Let me go on. The, the, the question, um, oh, okay, go on. I do understand that historically. The, the general lady's time, it's expired, but you can ask your question. Okay, I'll just okay, ask this sure. one, and I'll, I'll leave it alone. But I think we are getting the picture. I think we're getting a picture here. And we're talking about a toxic substance. I do understand that historically mercury fillings have been labeled silver fillings because of their color. Is that something you understand? I've heard and used that phrase, yes. Okay. However, that title is no longer relevant and it no longer fits and is desperately in need of a scientific update. Why does the ADA insist on using the term silver fillings to describe amalgam rather than more appropriately referring to mercury fillings? And why doesn't the ADA advocate for implementation of the recognized best practice of calling these fillings mercury fillings. Now you represent the ADA. Can the, you tell us? The, the witness can answer the question and then we're yeah. going to complete this round. Um, I think the ADA can answer that question in writing. Again, that's not within the area in which I represent are, them. Are you can, refusing can, to answer verbally? I'm saying I'm not the one that knows the answer, so But I, you're representing the ADA. I'm representing them, as I said in my opening statement, based on amalgam back. wastewater issues. Well, uh, let me pick up where uh, the general lady left off, and that is that uh, uh, you heard the question answered or asked, and uh, I would like to see an answer in writing. We, we will. 
I, I just, I appreciate you being here. Um, until myself and my colleagues get answers, definitive answers to these questions, we're not going to be able to put this issue to rest. And we'll be coming back and back and back. I mean, I we'll, just, we'll be happy to answer I, I, all I of mean, those I, questions. Th that's why, you know, we're, we're hoping these hearings are Mr. going to... Mr. Chairman, would you yield so I can ask you a question? I would hope that if we do another hearing, we will require someone who is a professional dentist from the ADA rather than the attorney, because the questions I'm asking really should be responded to by a professional. Well, I'll ask staff to take uh, to, to uh, be mindful yeah. of, of your request. Uh, Maybe we can put it in writing and see if we can get somebody, not the attorney, well, no, we, who can't know, speak. From Mr. Them. Walsh is aware of the. Uh, rules that this committee uh, has to produce witnesses so you know you can facilitate that working with the committee I'm sure thank you thank you uh, mr. Kane in your testimony you conclude that quote EPA's estimate uh, understates emissions of mercury from human cremation your own scientific work estimates the true emissions to be about at least seven times the estimate from EPA isn't that right that's right in the uh, is the problem of mercury air emissions by a crematoria likely to increase, decrease, or stay the same, in your opinion? In, in my opinion, I, I agree with Mr. Rindel that over the next 10 years it will increase. Um, I think over, over the much longer term it will decrease as a result of um, better dental care and the, and the reduced so, need for dental amalgam fillings, but so for the next decade it will certainly Mr. increase. Mr. Rindel, what's the European research about mercury air emissions from crematoria showing? I, I would agree with what Mr. Kane had said. The peak appears to um, be forecast to occur about 2020, and after that period of time, it, it will start to decrease. So, do, so does mercury in the teeth of deceased persons amount to a significant source of air emissions from crematoria? In my opinion, yes, a very significant source. Going back to Mr. Kane, your paper in the Journal of Industrial Ecology was published in 2007 but you've been presenting your work since 2005 at scientific conferences, and isn't that right? That's correct. And in those years, did your work ever have an impact on EPA's official air emissions inventory? No, it did not. Now EPA has informed us that they're in a process. That was the word that uh, Ms. Stoner used, process of developing an automated internet-based procedure of receiving actual emission measurements and calculating with them by uh, algorithm emissions factors in a dynamic way. Before my staff uh, spoke with you about that, have you ever heard from anyone in the EPA that the agency was revamping its emissions inventory in this way? No, I had not. And do you think, based on what you know so far, that this new procedure is assured of getting the air emissions from mercury, of mercury from crematoria right or are possible complications? Uh, or are there possible complications that could compromise the new inventory system? I, I think there are complications. I mean, certainly to have additional stack testing would be a beneficial thing. Um, I think uh, for some of the reasons I stated in my testimony, uh, you need to be careful that the stack testing is uh, representative uh, and that um, it's probably a good idea to uh, not rely entirely on stack tests but also to look at techniques such as looking at how much mercury is actually going into the crematory, which is easier to do than to measure the mercury coming out. So what are some of the other difficulties that could get in the way of the EPA's new system of emission factors, accurately determining emission factors for mercury air emissions from crematory and sludge incinerators? Um, I think the, the biggest problem is, is getting representative samples uh, for emissions tests. Uh, the other problem is that you know, Mercury air emissions uh, testing is uh, difficult to do. I mean, you, um, it's easier to make mistakes. I mean, it's fairly easy to, com to count fillings in a person's mouth, but more difficult to measure micrograms of mercury uh, per cubic meter of air. So it, it, I think it, it would require a lot of air emissions testing. So what, so what questions do you think Congress should be pursuing with EPA to ensure uh, that there are new air, uh, air mercury emissions from crematoria aren't as mistaken as the old estimates? I would uh, think that uh, um, asking EPA to consider all the available evidence, both stack testing and other types of evidence, uh, would be appropriate. Mr. Uh, Rindel, do you have any comment on that? 
Well, besides the comments that Mr. Kane made about the difficulty in measuring the stack emissions, what we have found through a literature review is actually much of the mercury doesn't go through the stack and that they have found that the mercury emissions actually in the office of the crematoria are higher than the emissions outside, suggesting that the emissions are not going necessarily up the stack, but are going through leaks, if you will, in the actual cremation unit. And so measuring the emissions from the stack is going to be very, very difficult. Another point to note is that there is no crematorium in the country that is required to have any air emission controls whatsoever. We have almost no data on an ongoing basis from any crematorium. The one crematory that was used 10 years ago had mainly just a, a water spray system to reduce some of the dust, but there, there is no other emissions control on, on any crematorium in the country otherwise. Uh, one of the, uh, thank you. Uh, just to, this, to staff, uh, one of the things that occurs to me is that as the EPA is going through this process, uh, we should call to the EPA's attention experts who are available, who have done research that might enable their process to be uh, uh, enriched by, uh, by that research. Hmm? Yeah, even especially ones who work there. <laughs> um, and I, I, I'm just, just a thought. Uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Watson. Uh, Mr. Brown, uh, you've heard my line of questioning, and uh, you heard the responses uh, that have come from Mr. Walsh. Uh, can you help us understand uh, the position of the ADA? Do you know anything about the American Dental Association and their opposition? to the amalgam fillings, the, the I, silver fillings? I don't. I, in fact, it, it pains me to have to say I, I have sort of the same answer that Mr. Walsh did. I can talk to you about the environmental disposition of the mercury once it leaves the dental okay, office. Okay. Well, but, can you? Not the please. rest. I, I mean, Maybe it's not a, that's something that uh, might be compelling as we try to gather more evidence and try to change the ADA's position about amalgams. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the environmental impact, because we all know that the waste goes to the uh, sewer management and then out into the ocean. And we just heard the emissions, and there is no way uh, to, or they have not come up with a way to capture and to change the particles in the emissions. They go out into the environment. Can you help us? Well, uh, one of the things that um, preparation for this hearing and listening to the testimony is it occurs to me that uh, I need to go back and ask the Quicksilver Caucus if it has any recommendations to ECOS about incinerators, the mercury emissions from from uh, crematoria, because that's not an issue that, I mean, we're aware of it and we've looked at it, but we don't have a position on it, and it strikes me that we need to have one. All right. Mr. Kane, can you help us? Um, I can just I can note on the uh, question of uh, controlling mercury emissions from incinerators mm -hmm. uh, that one of the states in Region 5, Minnesota, um, has worked on a voluntary basis with the uh, Mortuary Association in the state and the um, uh, University of Minnesota, and they have come up with a uh, goal of reducing mercury emissions from crematoria by 75 percent. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a variety of uh, alternatives that they're going to look at, including uh, alkaline hydrolysis or pulling or, or dechlorinating teeth uh, prior to cremation. Yeah. Uh, I am aware and um, of many substances, uh, Mr. Brown, that um, can be used in place of the mercury in the amalgam. And I was told by the National Dental Association that, oh, they're too expensive and people will stop coming uh, and bringing their children or coming in for fillings because of the cost. Um, do you know of uh, any of the substitutes? Does anyone at the table here? Mr. Walsh, you can't speak uh, professionally. You just told me that, so I'll refer this to other panelists, maybe Mr. 
Rydell. Do you know of the separators? Yes. And Mr. Rydell, can you tell us how we can protect from further pollution of our environment uh, because of the mercury sewage? Well, uh, speaking on the cremation issue, obviously yeah. there are two ways to, to deal with it. One is to remove the teeth prior to cremation, and the other is to control the murky emissions during the process or use an alternative process such as the alkali hydrolysis process. Um, one of the challenges that Minnesota is facing is that they're not sure of what technology can help them meet their goal as for stack emissions. And as I mentioned before, not all the emissions go through the stack. So that is a very big challenge. So we still need more research is what you're saying. We still need more research. And when your chair noted to staff that EPA ought to involve experts on the cremation issue, I raised my hand to make a note that unfortunately we don't have many experts on this. When I have been doing this literature and uh, survey and contacting people in the field for over 10 years, I have never found anybody at a university in North America that has worked on this. I have never found anybody in the entire world that has done such a survey of uh, references on cremation. Uh, and in fact, some of the people that I was in contact with in Germany and Norway uh, are no, no longer involved in it. There simply aren't any experts I, I hear you in this loud field. And clear. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we're having this hearing, and I just appreciate the chair for allowing me to take part in this hearing. I'm on the subcommittee too, because mercury is a toxic substance that can do harm. And I am just shocked that professionals don't understand the harm that mercury can do in a filling. And they are still calling these silver fillings. You know, people like gold fillings and silver and so on. And I think uh, these misstatements and uh, holding back this information is very harmful to the health. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll just end by saying this. I'm about this, this, for improving our environment and keeping Americans healthy. And people who only consider the, the money that comes out of this profession from doing this, I think are an abomination to society. I am concerned about the health of young people. I'm a victim. And when we come and we bring professionals to this panel, and they're not straightforward and honest to us and do not want to share with the public, the public has a right to know about anything that is inserted in their bodies. And we, it's a proven fact that mercury is a very toxic substance. And I would hope that the dentist would understand and would have the knowledge, Mr. Rendell, of you know, how they are polluting the waste water. And uh, I would hope that they would not send an attorney who really doesn't understand the chemicals and the ingredients and the, what makes up an amalgam here to testify in front of this committee, and particularly when I'm on it, because I don't buy it. And, you know, we've been studying this, Mr. Chairman, for years. And so I'd like a professional in front of me that can tell me what they put into a person's mouth. And we'll share that information. You know, we fought for years to get the warnings on smoking. And now, we're, you know, almost on everything you buy in a market, you can find out the ingredients in there. And if you have allergies to peanuts, you better know there's peanuts in that candy bar you give to a kid because they can kill you. And if you're a professional medical person and you don't know, you're just as guilty as somebody who put a gun to their head. And with that, I yield back. I thank, uh, thank the gentlelady from California for her participation in this hearing and all the other members who uh, participated. This is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform. Today's hearing is assessing EPA's efforts to measure and reduce mercury pollution from dentist offices. Uh, we've had two, two panels of witnesses. I want to thank the um, 
panel in front of us for their participation. Uh, this committee will uh, continue to retain jurisdiction over this matter uh, related to uh, uh, various types of mercury toxicity and their circulation in the broader um, society. Uh, as you can see, there are members of, of this uh, subcommittee, myself included, who have very strong feelings on this. Uh, it's noteworthy because as chairman, I uh, rely very closely on how the members of my committee feel about what we should pay attention to. So that having been said, uh, to the best of your ability to help us uh, move this along to um, compliance and to protect the public health uh, be much appreciated. So with that, uh, this subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>